All right. Welcome back here to Pucks in Deep. I'm your co-host, Connor Thelman, and with me, as always... Your co-host, James Murray. Connor, what do we got for us this week? Well, it is Frozen Four time, James, which means we have another Duluth Bulldogs championship that we're going to be celebrating on Saturday night. That's just my prediction. That's next but Saturday for you. That's but next yeah. Saturday. Okay. Uh, but this that's week, we're going to be talking uh, all the you know matchups, the storylines that are going to be going into that, kind of what happened in regionals, and who better than just two massive voices of college hockey... We have Kobe Cohen and Dave Starman. Yeah, no. I've uh, heard of them. Yeah, two great hockey minds. Ooh. We're lucky to have them on the podcast this week as we uh, preview the Frozen Four and what would be a dandy with three Minnesota teams in the Frozen Four, along with uh, yep. maybe my favorite team in the tournament, UMass. Uh, I think I think they're the most skilled, but we'll see here. But uh, yeah, great two guys to, to go over um, what is going to be an amazing Frozen Four. Again, we want to thank our proud sponsor of the ECH Bracket Challenge this year. Thank you for everybody who signed up. But that is brought to you by DraftKings. Uh, James, why don't you tell the people we got going on there? Yeah, you're going to want to download the top-rated sports betting app in DraftKings. Use promo code THPN. You're going to get a weekly uh, signing bonus for starting up. And uh, yeah, I mean... I mean, you could turn $1 into $100. Why would you not want to do that? Download the Mm. app, DraftKings, and get going. Start making some bank. People helping people. Welcome back to Pucks and Deep. Today is March 31st, and joining us today is the man, the myth, the Dave Starman. Dave, welcome to the show. Hey, it's good to be around. <laughs> hey, yeah, man, it's been a crazy tournament so far. We're happy to have you here in the midst of you being a very busy guy and uh, doing a great job covering the NCAA tournament so far. What are your thoughts on what's happened so far? Well, it's, it's, been, it's been unique with all the ones having lost. And you can make an argument that there are a couple of twos that might have been ones. And you can make an argument that there are a couple of ones that it was hard to determine wh- where they placed out just because of the fact that we didn't have any interconference games between a lot of the bigger teams. So I, I think right. we've seen a couple of surprises. I think the Bemidji State thing surprised a lot of people beating Wisconsin, though. I've often said there's not a lot of difference between fours and ones in the NCAA tournament. It's not like basketball where it's a 16 and a one. The four yeah. and the one, I think those teams are a lot closer. So I, <laughs> I, I sometimes get surprised when people are as surprised when that happens. And then obviously we've got the five overtime marathon in Fargo that certainly stole some of the headlines. Be careful what you say about Bemidji, Dave, because James is a Bemidji alum. So just want to give you the warning. <laughs> no, that, hey, that's why. Listen, yeah, I've seen just... a ton of Bemidji over the last few years. I, I mean, I was a free agent scout for Montreal during my time there. I think I chased Zach Whitecloud all over the country. So I like, I've yeah, seen it up in Bemidji. You, uh... I yeah, actually to, met you to be able to really talk about them. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I met you once. You came. It was in White Clouds last year, I think. You were you came in Toby's office uh, at Bemidji State, Toby Palmasino, and so I met you for a second briefly. But I was there the past uh, three of the past five years there. So it's a great it's a great building. It's a great hockey community up there too. I I enjoy when they have success. Yeah, absolutely. It's cool to see them beat Wisconsin. I think it was just like you said, a shock. Um, maybe not a shock, but and the big the Big Ten going zero and two to WCHA this tournament. What do you think about that though? It's, you know, it's interesting. I, when you talk about the big 10, I think the big 10 attracts a lot of great players, but when you look at the big 10, you can make an argument that while they've got a lot of great players, you wonder about how many great teams that they actually put together. Now it's funny because I think with Ohio state, like Ohio state gets real good players, but they tend to create pretty good teams. Notre Dame to me gets pretty good players and they tend to create pretty good teams that I think don't get as much credit for being as offensively gifted and creative as they should. Then you'll look at Michigan and Wisconsin. Now they get a lot of A plus guys, but I think for them, it's harder to build that great team because there's constant turnover. and There's not a lot of lineage between some of the players that should have been seniors who leave as sophomores. And then some of the younger guys who you were hoping learn the culture from some of the returning guys, especially the key guys. So the big 10 becomes this, you know, a little bit of a, a mystery at times as to, how good they are team-wise, despite having some really high-end players that we know we're going to see in the National Hockey League for many years. Right. Just to kind of spinball off that, like you were calling the Fargo Regional there. Were you, uh, if if Michigan were to make the, to actually be able to play on that one, obviously pretty disappointing that they tested positive and had to bow out. How far do you think Michigan could have made that run? Because we were picking them. Maybe they could have been a Frozen Four team had they been in that regional. Okay, so talent-wise you could say that they were probably better 
than Minnesota Duluth. I mean, you look at some of their right. top six, top five forwards, look at their defense score. I mean, you can make a case that Michigan might have been the more skilled team. The one thing we've all learned in the NCAA tournament, it's not necessarily the most skilled team that wins this thing. Now, I know that there are a lot of people out there that when they're picking teams or especially when they're picking elite teams, you say to yourself, let's get the 23 most skilled guys and here we go. Mm-hmm. In college hockey, that's not the case. That's more for a tournament team, not for a long run team. Now, Michigan was kind of built like a tournament team at times with some of these high end guys that you know could catch fire for four games and go. The only problem is the tournament's at the end of the season, not the beginning of the season. So if you play that regional the first weekend of the season, I would say Michigan's in great shape. You play that tournament at the end of the season like it is, Minnesota Duluth is a team that has been there. They know how to win. They've got patience. They've got poise. They can grind out a game. I've never seen a team that can be in any kind of game at any point of that game and really look calm and relaxed. I mean, they were four overtimes in. There was no panic on that team whatsoever. So that's what Michigan was going to run into. So you've got the experience of Minnesota Duluth versus a little bit of the inexperience of Michigan. And if you're in Michigan and you're down 2-0 towards the end of that game, do they pull off what North Dakota did and get that game tied? Mm -hmm. Because North Dakota, even though they never made the tournament, I mean, that's a pretty special group too. So, I mean, like, I I can't give you a great answer how far does (laughs) Michigan go. I will say that I do think Michigan would have struggled against Minnesota Duluth just because anybody would have struggled against Minnesota Duluth. I like it. I know North Dakota Dakota was your team, Dave. You upset? What's that? North Dakota was your guys going in. Well, North Dakota, they were they were a team that was really well put together. Here's the interesting part about them. None of their players, none of their high-end guys had ever played in the national tournament. And it was something that I brought up during that five overtime game. And when you think back on that, it's it's really remarkable. And it's funny because people banged on North Dakota a lot for not making the national tournament two years in a row. Look at what they lost. And I and I said it during the broadcast. Unfortunately, I don't have the notebook with me, but I, I said it during the broadcast. I mean, they they win the national tournament. They win the national title. They come back the next year. And then after that next year, they lose guys like Jost and Besser and Thompson and Ledoux. And they lost so many character guys as seniors off the national title team, Chiswick and Sanderson and St. Clair. And then you keep moving along and the losses keep piling up. You lose Cam Johnson, who's your national title goalie. You lose Troy Stetcher. I mean, they lost a lot of big names. So people are like, well, where's North Dakota? But if you look at their numbers over the years that they didn't make the national tournament, they cut the goals against down. They were still scoring. They just play in a great league. And it became mathematics and percentage points, not necessarily anything North Dakota really did to themselves. So the fact that they went on this great run for the last two years, I mean, they reloaded well. And they were able to reload well because there were humongous holes in their lineup for the big guns that left because they're all playing the NHL. But they were able to refill it with elite level guys. Now, elite level guys are going to go running onto your roster if you've got elite level guys there because they won't play. Right. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, some of these high end NHL guys leave and they reloaded beautifully. And I, I really credit North Dakota with the job they did over the last four years. I remember you saying on the broadcast that you don't think Caulfield's got the Hobie locked up. You think Pinto might be able to snag it from him. That's a good one. I mean, we just finished the Hobie call and, you know, we're really not at liberty to discuss a lot of what went on there, but there was a lot of talk about Caulfield. There was a lot of talk about Pinto. And I'll tell you what, I, I, I like, I like Pinto's season. I think Caulfield's a wonderful player. I remember I was on Montreal staff when we drafted him. And I mean, I'm not there anymore, but I was on that staff to draft him. And I know how highly they thought of him. And I think the world of him, and I think this were last world juniors to me really show what Cole Caulfield's all about and what I think he can do as a player. And I think he's going to be very successful at the NHL level for a myriad of reasons. I'm not going to bore you with, but I do think that Shane Pinto is a centerman. That's where the argument gets interesting because to me, even when I'm scouting, if I'm looking at two players of equal caliber in terms of whether it be a draft free agency trade, whatever I'm taking the centerman because I think they have a harder job. So for Pinto to put up the numbers that he put up as a center, as opposed to a winger where your defensive responsibilities are a little bit different. Plus you got face off responsibilities like I just think it's a closer race than it should have been and I don't think anybody this year should have been anointed the Hobie considering how good both Caulfield and Pinto were yeah I think that's a fair argument especially I mean isn't Pinto wasn't he top 10 in face off percentage too so he did his centerman job you know better than almost every center in the league too so and there's like a lot of good centers been. in the NCHC I mean you know like Paul yeah. Washington Western Michigan the terrific centerman you, you you got the Cates brothers in Minnesota, Duluth, they were great centermen. I mean, you got a lot of really good centermen in the NCHC. So for him to put up the numbers he put up in the conference only, 
against some of some of the really good centers in the conference. I mean, that's it's pretty impressive. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. Also, he came on the Pucks and Deep podcast, so he had the ECH bump that has to, be, <laughs> you know, has to bring that into the discussion a little bit too. But uh, <laughs> I just wanted to say, Dave, the voice sounds pretty good for calling that five overtimes game. You know, how did you feel after that one? How many bathroom breaks were you allowed uh, to kind of survive that call? Because right now, it's it, it's like it, it never even happened for you. You sound good. Oh, let's see, bathroom breaks two. <laughs> and here's Only the thing. two. And okay. I'm a veteran now. Like, I'll tell you what, as soon as that period ended and I knew we were throwing it right to the studio, I was gone. Like, I'm telling you, we, we weren't in break yet, and I was already there. The men's room was maybe 20 feet away. Like, Leo would look over, and all you saw was a headset. Like, I'm, <laughs> uh, I probably oh, went yeah. through about 10 or 11 cups of Bigelow tea, which I love to drink during the broadcast. You know, I bring this big thermos. Like, I mean, I've got this thing with me now, but I've got like three of them filled with hot water for every broadcast and just so I can make nice. tea. And so that was, uh, that was a help. And, you know, then you snack as you go along. I had a ton of fruit and energy bars with me. I mean, like, let's put this way. I wasn't the guy you had to worry about in terms of bathroom breaks and energy. I mean, what I was watching on the ice was remarkable. And the fact yeah. that, that yeah. those guys kept up what they kept up for that long. I know there's stretch of that game where not a lot happened in overtime, but the fact that that game had the intensity and a pace that it had for as long as it did, I, I think is really remarkable and a, a credit to, to young athletes. I mean, we all remember being that young and, you know, ask yourself if you could have played eight periods of that kind of intensity hockey with a trip to the frozen four and maintain that kind of poison pace. No chance. Barely play three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm bowing out there for sure. I mean, I saw a tweet like they had IVs and drinking Coke in the locker room just to keep going. I mean, that's what Kawaguchi then said, I think, but like, that's insane though. <laughs> No. Well, I, I mean, I remember I'll take as a funny story about that. When when I was coaching in Macon, it was my first year in with, with the Macon Whooping in the Central League. That's the jersey right there. there. And we we were going into the playoffs against Memphis, and the playoffs started like late March, early April. And the week the playoffs started was the first week where it got really hot in Macon. And we all lived at a big condo complex about 10 minutes from the rink. And I remember we skated that morning and I talked to the team after practice. I said, okay, listen, you know, games tomorrow, game one. It's a really nice day out. Be smart. Go hydrate. <laughs> stay inside. Go to the mall. Go to the movies. Stay inside. Eat and drink. But, but stay hydrated. Don't be outside a lot. You guys from Quebec and northern Ontario and northern Minnesota, you guys are not used to this heat and humidity. Trust me. And you got to stay inside. So what happens? An hour later, I get back to the condo complex. The whole team's at the pool. And, <laughs> and, and, I, and I just I just knew we were going to be, literally, we were going to, we were fried. And so the next night, uh, you know, I kind of, like, first of all, half the guy showed up with a tan, the coach went bananas and <laughs> we, uh, and he's uh -huh. screaming at me. I'm like, what do you want me to do? So, and then we were playing a game and I think the game went in overtime or two, if I remember correctly, I just remember being a long game, really humid inside the building. And we were losing a player like every 10 minutes as that game went on to <laughs> dehydration and cramps. And like, every time we went into the locker room, like there was somebody else on an IV and you know, that's how I understood this the concept of what goes under in these long overtime games. I've been in a couple of them as a coach in the playoffs at the pro level. And, you know, once you get into there, it's a lot of bananas to replace potassium. It's a lot of Gatorade to replace the electrolytes. It's a lot of water. It's, it's potentially some IVs. It's yeah. Guys might drink a Coke or two to get some caffeine or, or maybe an iced coffee, but like it becomes survival of the fittest. It becomes laying on the ground with your legs up to, to help your circulation. I mean, it is wild. Some of the things that some guys will put ice on their necks and their head to cool their body down a little bit. I mean, uh, one guy took a shower between periods. I mean, like there's, there's a million different things. Some of these guys were doing just to stay hydrated and stay cool. And, and I was amazed that only one player, just one goalie stays cool was the only guy that cramped up and, and couldn't finish. I figured we'd have a couple more. Yeah. Yeah. That was surprising though. And uh, I talked to Fante after the game briefly, but I mean, credit to both of those goalies for staying in there for so long in such a long game it was great. Great game to watch, but uh, talk about the atmosphere in Fargo, though. Like, how good is it to have fans back? I mean, it seemed pretty loud from watching on TV. What was that? I'll tell you what. E even the week before in Grand Forks, with having yeah. people back in the building for the frozen faceoff, I mean, when, when North Dakota scored the goal to tie Denver one-one, the place was only thirty percent full. It felt full, and Fargo felt <laughs> full. And I say that three times, and it was just it was <laughs> awesome that uh, it was awesome that we had the fans here. I mean, I I really enjoyed it, and you know, for me. I've been with the NCHC, you know, in the CBS package for 10 years now. Like we've built some relationships with the fan bases, you know, between our broadcast crew and, and the fans. And I think those fans in the NCHC understand that we really care about their teams. And we care about this product. And so you're able to maintain some relationships with fans, maintain relationships with the families. 
I got to tell you, the coolest thing was after that five overtime game was being able to see some of the North Dakota fans and talk to them a little bit. They were despondent and upset, but you know, they know that I understood what they went through because I've lived the season with North Dakota to a large extent. I've done so many of their games and, you know, then seeing a Minnesota Duluth friends and family and interacting with them and having them in the building made that event that much better. I couldn't imagine doing eight periods with nobody in the building. I it just, it would have been bizarre. And the overtime yeah. Sally wouldn't have been as cool too. That would have sucked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised he had the energy. Well, actually, no, I'm not because you know, that was the line that hadn't been on the ice a ton. And I remember bringing up in the fourth overtime that they were starting to play and they looked great. I mean, that line with, with low height and no, I mean, they were beyond it. They were yeah. flying. And I'm not, like, I'm not going to tell you I thought they were going to score the game-winning goal. I mean, that's, you know, that's making me sound like a moron. But I did bring <laughs> up that they were that they were playing well, and I brought up the Peter Klima thing in the 90 finals, you know, where he was sat on the bench for three hours for the Oilers because Buckler wouldn't play him. And then you know, they get into third overtime, you needed fresh legs. So Klima jumped on the ice for the first time in three hours and scored the three-overtime winner. So, like, you, you just saw that script starting to build. It was kind of neat to see it happen. I got to step in and say something from a player's perspective. Three hours on the bench does not give you fresh legs. I'd be probably in a, in a worse in a worse position than I would be if I was playing every other shift. Well, I don't Three know what's more remarkable: the fact that those guys could have sat for that long and then come out and been as energetic as they was or were, or Fanty coming off the bench after five hours of not playing and yeah. being as sharp yeah, as no he way. was. Like it's like when he came in, I'm thinking in the back of my head, you know what's going to happen here? Gavin Haynes is going to get a puck at the top of the circle and he's going to blow it past Fanty before he even moves. And yeah. it's not, it won't be Fanti's fault. It'll just, they come off the bench that cold. I mean, Hayne can just shoot BBs. And I'm thinking to myself, like, here it comes. This poor kid's going to get one shot. And the end's yep. blowing over his shoulder. And it's going to be game over. Mm -hmm. I was so impressed with, with Fanti and how cool he was. And then you turn it around, you know, thinking to myself, like, most of the time I played, I came off the bench. You know, I mean, I wasn't a, for, except for one season, I was a starter. But I mean, for the most part, I played a lot of mop-up duty and, I always felt coming in off the bench was great because you're down six two. You know, good for me. Here I come, <laughs> no pressure. This is a whole different coming off the bench scenario. I give yeah, that yeah, kid yeah. a ton of credit, and I guarantee you, it's because Sandy and the group played him so much early that he felt like no matter what, he could play, even though he didn't start the game. I guarantee his confidence wasn't hit at all. Yeah, yeah, I think Sandy's done a great job there too. But you know, like you said, I mean this. It was the fourth overtime that came in, but they're going for a three-peat. You know, how likely do you think that is that Duluth can win three in a row here at the Frozen Four? Right now, very. I mean, they, they sold Woo. me. I got to be honest. I mean, like, I, I'm not anointing them. Don't get me wrong. I, I know three <laughs> other teams are going to listen to this and say that son of a bitch is Duluth. But, you know, I, it, that's not the case at all. But I will tell you this. I mean, wow. they they There's just a team that has figured it out. And it's funny because – you know, yes, they won that game. They handled the two goals at the end of the third period and, and came back, and they almost got scored on the first minute of overtime, and they figured it out, and they won a game. But, like, I've watched them do that now for, like, a couple of years. And even yeah. before they won the national title, I've, I've watched them do that for a couple of years. And, and you know, Brett Larson, like, I guarantee, you know, Larson and St. Cloud State are on the other side, but Larson is part of that culture that helped UMD become what they are now. And, I mean, he understands what they're about, too. And he's starting to build St. Cloud in that same mold with, with that kind of poison patience. And, but here's the thing. I mean, UMass is, UMass is a really good team. Like I love the way they play. And yeah. you know, the team, I coach a U15 or I was part of a coaching staff on a U15 team this year. And I was working with our defense on playing the way UMass's defense plays. I mean, they play up and aggressive and they defend off the puck so well. And they, they've got such great mobility and they are a big ring team that can shrink it much like St. Cloud that can do. They're a big ring team that can shrink it and, and be mobile. So you know, you, I don't think for one second UMD is going to walk away with this thing. But no. I would say the intangible of experience, yeah, that they have. I think yeah. you're just being biased about UMass because your son's in the band. <laughs> <laughs> and he does plus minus once in a while, too. Like, he's got that down pat now, too. <laughs> <laughs> what about the other side of the bracket here? You know, I think uh, the St. Cloud game was remarkable, too, after, you know, they lose their top uh, scorer in Brodzinski. He goes out. He's done for the season now, unfortunately. Uh, we wish him a quick recovery. But talk about that comeback. You know, they're down one zip. He gets hurt. and They come back and win 3-1. You know, how, did, how do you think they did that? Oh, God. you know, similar to what they've been all year. Like, they're a team that's been really balanced. And they don't get frazzled. Like I, I, the one thing I've seen with St. Cloud is they just don't get aggravated. Like they just play. And I think it's the combination of they're not too old, but they're not too young. You know, Renat can make big saves when he has to. He can be a little inconsistent, but he can make a big save when he has to. And when he settles into a game, he tends to be very good. 
their defense core, I mean, outside of Perbix, I mean, their defense core, Donahue has been great for them, but outside of those guys, like their defense core is very workmanlike. You know, Perbix is solid and Donahue's solid, but then you yeah. get Bushy and Meyer who are, who are really good second pair. And then you got Jay Cox and Trable who, who are a good third pair. And I like Trable a ton and Jay Cox could play for me anytime. I mean, he's got his ups and downs, but that kid's a warrior who just answers the bell and wherever you need him, he can play. So you got a defense court that doesn't panic. They're smart. They're simple. They don't overestimate their abilities. There are some of their parts and they, they do really good things, but they defend well. And that's why St. Cloud State will always be in a game. I mean, they may give up two, but it's hard to get three on them between the goaltender and the D. And then up front, they got great speed. And that line with the two fins and Akabe, which used to be the two fins in Brodzinski. Like, that's how it started. And then they took Brodzinski off that line. Akabe's on that line now. They're all kind of the same age. They're all kind of the same player. I mean, that line is as good as any line to me that's in the Frozen Four. Yeah, well, uh, so I just want to jump in, like, is, to talk about, uh, kind of hit on every team except for Mankato right now. And maybe their biggest centerpiece would be their Mike Richter, you know, candidate and Dryden McKay. Would you say that he's currently... I mean, especially in the Frozen Four, is he just hands down the best goalie left? Or is anybody like Philip Lindbergh, you know, kind of close to his level? And, you know, how is that going to play into the matchups here? You know what? That's a really good question. I, I really like Dryden McKay. I think, you know, he had the little hiccup against Northern Michigan, and, and but he recovered from that yeah. pretty well. And, and you know, but now the lights get a little brighter. And when the lights get a little brighter and you haven't been there before, I mean, it could be, it could be a little overwhelming. But I think he's got the mentality to handle this. And, you know, he plays in a program. To me, Mike Hastings is as good a coach there is in college hockey. And I think that he's been able sure. to prepare his team by keeping them calm and, and not letting them listen to the white noise. And the one good thing about Minnesota State is that they have had a great free agent defenseman on their team for a decade. Like, I remember going back to when I scouted for the Leafs and running around. Who was it? Nelson, I think I was running around chasing back at that time. Like, Casey? three good ones. Casey Nelson? No, no. Yeah, that's it. Right? The guy signed with Buffalo. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So they've had Nelson, then they had Brickley, and now they've got Mackey. And like I've been watching Minnesota State now for a decade, and it's because of those three great free agent defensemen that they've had. And the one thing that Mike Hastings has done a really good job of is he's kept the white noise of them being followed around out of his locker room. So they're used to playing in front of eyeballs that matter, and they've always played well. So now, granted, the again the stage gets bigger. The crowds won't be as big, so you're not going to have to worry about a this big True. partisan crowd rooting against you type of thing. I think Minnesota State's going to go in there calm, cool, veteran team. They understand how to win. Like I, I love this matchup between St. Cloud and Minnesota State. Uh, it's a great matchup coaching-wise. It does a lot of familiarity between those kids. Those kids are playing against each other forever. So I, I don't think there's a whole lot of surprises. I'd love to have an opinion on it. I, I'm not quite sure I do because I, I, this is overwhelming. I mean, like this, it is. There's 200 yeah. guys in the portal. As a matter of fact, Chris Lurch from USCHO the other day said, "I hope they're all socially distancing in there because there's so many of them." <laughs> I mean, like it's, it's freaking bananas. But um, I think that when you get schools with coaching changes, I mean, that I can understand. Like, I guarantee you, yeah. Todd Woodcroft walked into Vermont and said, if "This is the way we're going to do this. You're in or you're out." Or mm-hmm. he walked in and said, "This is the way we're going to do this, and you have to be out." Like one of two things happened. Todd's a no-nonsense guy. Chris Bergeron of Miami is probably doing a lot of similar things like that too. Like here's the line in the sand. And at some point, you know, we got to draw some what ifs and, and no mores. And, you know, I, I guarantee you, you'll see a little bit more at, at Miami with, with Mike Cavan leaving CC, who was so well respected by his players. Mm. You know, you're seeing a couple of big guns there that are moving out too. So, I mean, like this, yeah. this transfer portal is unique. And I know a lot of people are bagging on the players. Like, oh, yeah, if it's not working for you there, what's the easiest thing to do? Quit and go somewhere else instead of sticking it out? Listen, I, you got four years. And if, exactly. and if the program right. you're in, the program you're in, you don't feel can help you get to the level that you want to get to. I mean, that's a decision you got to make as a player. I I don't love seeing guys running around. I've always been worried about players with closets full of different sweaters before they get to the to the highest levels. But I think this is a little different. And I don't I don't necessarily begrudge some of these players for – looking for the best opportunity for them to develop, to get to the level that they want to get to. I mean, you got four years. It's not like, you know, it's not like you got 10, you know, so <laughs> if you got to make the most of it somewhere else, you do. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. Also, you I think the rules player. changed, right? Oh, sorry, James. I no, said the, the rules changed, I think, where guys don't have to sit out for the full year, so they're more inclined to do it. Like, I know when I transferred, I was like dreading doing that full year, and I, and I kind of missed out on a year, so I did three instead of four, you know, like, the fact that you can just transfer now and play right away has changed the mentality, I think, of players in general because they know they're not sitting in a suit in the stands for an entire year. They're going to go play right away and get a new opportunity at, at a you know a fresh start. I kind of think if I had transferred and sat out a year, nobody would have noticed. That's how I'm, like, <laughs> I'm so jealous of of this whole thing. But I like I, 
I look at here's my thing with the players. I mean, everybody talks about you got to control the transfer thing. Guys just can't leave and go somewhere else. There's got to be some kind of repercussion. But you know what? Coaches leave too. Like coaches yeah. can go recruit a player, and all of a sudden True. they jump to another school. You know, or or like a better job comes up. I mean, they leave a school that'd be like a mid major and jump to like the big bright bright shiny object school, or or you know, take an NHL job or whatever. I mean, and nobody you know nobody says a word on that either. So if the coaches can can go after and not have to worry about it. You know, maybe, maybe the players deserve that too. I, I don't know. It's a weird dynamic. And, but I, I do think we need players to play because the product's better when they do. Yeah. Yeah. We're just going to do a lot of studying this off season. I think, you know, tracking everyone where they're going, I think it's going to be interesting, but like you said, players got to do like they have four years, sometimes less and, you know, they got to do what they got to do to make it to that next level. It's an interesting point, but uh, yeah, it's like play it's player bingo right now. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's going to suck for some schools, especially like Bowling Green last 400 point scores that's gonna it lost a lot of guys to the portal so far i mean they still got to be picked up but um yeah it's gonna be interesting next year to see all these players in new new places yeah, well, look at cc like, i mean crookshank <laughs> copeland Conzo, yeah. like they got a lot of guys that hit the portal now i know this doesn't necessarily mean they're all gonna go i mean that's the right. other part of it too i mean you know they may hit the port i get sure. here's the other thing i mean you might get some players in the transfer portal say, hey i'm in the transfer portal and coach the transfer portal and said good for you you know, but <laughs> and that doesn't mean they're going anywhere, right? I mean, that's the yeah. other part of it. I mean, you can declare free agency, and everybody else may say that's you know good for you. We have no interest. So, I mean, that's the other part of it. We'll see how that all shakes out. Yeah, it'd be interesting. True. Yeah, one thing I wanted to ask uh, Dave about is you know being a Long Island guy. What's your you know take on the first season for Long Island there and Brett Riley, the coach? You know how they handled everything. I mean, they I think they would have nobody really predicted them to do as well as they did. I would say, but uh, what is your take on their first season? Well, anybody, any Riley that's coaching a team, that team's going to be okay. Let's we'll start there. I mean, there's yeah. just there's pedigree yeah. there, and they know what they're doing. So, I mean, that's that's number one. I I tell you what, Brett and I had a little bit of a misunderstanding. Like there was there was something about Long Island season, and like we were finishing, they we share a practice rink with them, so we were finishing up our practice, and it, it just rained, and because of the rings, you got to come out one way and in another way. So we're coming out the back door. They're trying to come in the same entrance to unload their bus <laughs> after a game at Quinnipiac. The parking lot was a gong show between puddles, snow mountains, cars, kids coming out. Like, I mean, it was, it was unreal what was going on there. And I made a comment about how, like, I was talking to a couple of their players. How's the season going? What's going on? Oh, my God, I was happy with you guys. I said, and by the way, this unpacking of the bus is really impressive. I mean, you got this guy's, you got this down. And it was referring to all the chaos in the parking lot. Well, anyway, I put it on Twitter and it got <laughs> totally misunderstood. Like their women's coach flipped the frick out and, hammered me and I, he t nobody got it. And after reading it back, I said, okay, I see where everybody made this mistake. And it was meant to be a compliment. So Brett and I squared away and we were all good. But like what they did this year is really impressive considering that they put this together during a pandemic. Yeah, and but I mean, they, I mean, they didn't tell anybody they were announcing and you know, the 80 is a bit of a maverick. He's a pretty good dude. And so they kind of announced this thing in the middle of nowhere. Don't tell anybody. Then they came out and do it. They put this thing together in the middle of a pandemic. They're moving to a couple of different rinks and they put this season together and, and it worked. And I got to tell you, for a long time, I, you know, I've been screaming about how I think that Philadelphia and Long Island are two markets and Chicago, that's a third, are three markets that I really think need major college hockey. They need division one. College. I'd love to see Villanova go D1. Or I'd love to see Penn get a D1 team back. I'd love to see, you know, where the Illinois Chicago comes back or, or a team in Northwestern would be perfect. Like, I just think those are three great markets for college hockey. And LIU jumped. I figured it was going to be Stony Brook or Hofstra. LIU jumped. Good for them. The women's team's had some success. And I think the men's team will continue to have success. And we'll see where this takes us. But you know what? For a lot of Long Island players, it's been play for a long time and then go play somewhere else. Now, I think for a lot of Long Island kids, they and I'm telling you, the whole 04, 05, 06 clan, they are fleeing Long Island like crazy right now to play elsewhere. But they're going to have a place to come home to if they want to. And that is really, really cool. I never thought I'd see it. Yeah, as a Long Island player myself, I, I mean, I know if I had the chance to transfer back to LIU, I would have done it just to be home and, you know, play play near home. But I also, I just want to defend Brett Riley for a second because I think that night LIU got smacked like 7-1 to at Quinnipiac. So he probably wasn't, yeah, in, the, he probably yeah. wasn't <laughs> in the best mood. <laughs> yeah, he probably wasn't in yeah. the best mood when you when you made that joke. So I could see why he was a little angry. <laughs> no, and I said to Riles, like I said to Riles, I'm like, I, I can understand where you misinterpreted this, but like, <laughs> I used to go to, you know, I've been doing army games forever, you know, back to the old CSTV days. I said, I used to sit in your uncle, or your dad's office, drinking coffee with your grandfather. I, you know, whether it be 
Rob or or Brian, I said, I've known those guys forever. I said, do you really think I'd take a shot at you? I mean, <laughs> first of all, you, you know my place in college hockey. I would take a shot at anybody. I said, do you really think I'd take a shot at you, of all people? You know, I said, we share a practice ring, for God's sakes. And <laughs> So I, we squared the whole thing out and Brett and I are good, but like, I, I mean, I go way back with the Riley clan and I just think this is the coolest thing. I think there's one way to settle it. Your U14 team plays against LIU and the winner gets the rink. <laughs> Listen, are, are you, wait, are you 15th had enough trouble this season playing against some other U15 teams? This was a, <laughs> this was, this was one of those weird years. Cause you couldn't remember, you couldn't hold tryouts. Mm. So everybody's just signing uh, players left and right. But, I will tell you this, and this is this is a cool thing. I coached with two players that I that played for me with the Apple Core Junior Program, Zach Joseph and Mike Cavanaugh. And Zach went out and played two years at Michigan State, finished up playing Division Three, and and Cav played four years in Division Three. They were both really good defensemen when I had them with Apple Core, and I, I it was really cool to to kind of link back up with them. And the you know when we picked our team, I told them I said, listen, I think the Royals are going to have a better team than we are. I think PAL is going to have a better team than we are. But by the end of this year. No team will have gotten better like we will. I said, but I said we're going to get smoked early in the season by those two teams, and by the end of the year, that's not going to happen anymore. You watch. I said, trust me. I know what we can do as a staff, and we just got to get the players to buy in. But I know that as a staff, we're going to bring our players further than anybody else because we can, and we did. And that was a really good. I was really proud of our kids. I mean, they really worked their ass off this year, despite the fact that we were a little under talented compared to some of those other AAA teams we played at U15. Just kind of bag skated out of them from the sounds of it. <laughs> uh, you know, they, they, they sweated. I'll tell you that much, but you know, they embraced, they embraced it, which was kind of cool. Like, and I'm sort of on the modern side, like I'm not a big bag skate guy, but every once in a while you have to do it. I'd rather condition with a <laughs> game scenario. That's just kind of my coaching philosophy. And Donnie Granado right. gave me a great tip once. He said, whenever he got pissed at his team, when he was coaching at the national program, instead of bag skating them, he'd make them play four on four full ice. Because when oh. you play four and four full ice, like, and, oh. and you make sure that the intensity stayed up there. But when you play yeah. four and full ice, I mean, think about how much work you're doing because you're four guys doing a work of five. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, it's like full ice penalty killing. And I <laughs> like, to me, I like that progressive thinking. Yeah. Just, just that's, a more that's, fun way to yeah. bag. <laughs> yeah. That, that's what I'm that's saying. I mean, it's a constructive way to bag. Yeah. Yeah. Let's uh, keep talking about that age group, though, briefly here. I mean, I know you're a coach. We have a lot of kids that are. Um, from 10 years old to high school to, uh, and juniors right now, you know, what would be your advice for them to get to the division one level and be successful at the division one level, both as a player and a, and a student question. Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, a couple of things. Number one is I think now when you get to 14, 15 years old, you have got to make sure that you take charge of your own career. I mean, when mom, dad, stepmom, stepdad, legal guardian, whatever. I mean, they're, they all play a role, but like, it, there comes a point where, you have to be in charge of your career. You got to make sure that you're finding a good workout program and seeking out people you can train with. You've got to make sure that you're making time to get to the rink. You've got to make sure you're starting to eat properly and get proper rest and have good time management, get your homework done, get your studying done, get your extra help done and make sure that your academics are in order. Because if you are mentally free, knowing that you don't have a paper to do when you get home from practice or that you're failing a class or whatever, you're going to play that much better. Like if you feel good about yourself, you're going to feel good about yourself on the ice. So to me, the academic component is number one. The physical and mental component of being able to train properly is number two, because like we all know it. If you look good, if you look in the mirror and you feel good about who you are, you're mm -hmm. going to play better knowing that you put the hard yards in. And I think that is a huge factor. But no, the most important thing is you got to play for a good coach and a good program. Like there's a there's a lot of really bad mm -hmm. programs out there that that sell a lot of BS. And it, all of a sudden players go flocking to it. And you might be on a good team, but how well coached is that team? I mean, there's a lot of guys out there selling, being on a great team, but like, what are you doing in practice? Like, what are you getting taught? Are you getting prepared for the next level? The, to me, the race that you're trying to win is the long one to division one or division three. It's not the race to the end of that season. And there are a lot of coaches that want to put the super teams together so they don't have to do much. I, I, listen, I know a couple of them on Long Island. I worked with one. And I really think that get into a situation where you're in, with a program where the coaching staff preaches development, where the coaching staff is willing to lose a game to make better players, where the coaching staff is willing to put you into situations where you're going to grow from, hold you accountable, and create an atmosphere where you have the ability to get better every single day. That, to me, is paramount above all else. Yeah, good answer. That's that's really good advice right there. And yeah. Everyone listening, it's a great answer. Know. Just always want to say it's great to see you, Dave. Thanks for coming on, and uh, look look forward to chatting through the Frozen Four. 
I, I can't wait for this Frozen Four yeah. for all the reasons we talked about. This should be great. And I look forward to doing this again with you guys. That's, I mean, you guys do a great job. Let's keep it up. And everybody has to play a role in keeping college hockey in the forefront. So let's keep promoting this great game. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Perfect. Well, uh, yeah. Thank you for coming on today, Dave. And uh, we're actually going to be driving back and forth between, uh, I think, St. Cloud and Duluth. So uh, we will be hearing you on the radio call. So maybe give us a shout out. We'll take it. You know. <laughs> You, you got to remember to text me and get, listen, I've always told people, they're like, I'm afraid to text you in a game, whatever. 99% of the time, if you text me during a game, you're going to get mentioned. <laughs> Whether right. you want to or not. There have been times <laughs> where people have texted me during a game and then I mentioned, like, uh, I didn't want you to tell people that. But, <laughs> so just remind me that you're driving between both places. Trust me, I'll get it in. Absolutely. Boom. There we go. All right. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll be on that. We'll have Johnny give us that, give you that text shout out. But uh, yeah, again, just. <laughs> Really thankful for you coming on today, Dave, and looking forward to the Frozen Four and uh, re reoccurring guests as well. So thank you. You, you got it. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks. Yep. All right. Welcome back to Pucks in Deep. We got episode number 63 here. We are the null of podcasts, <laughs> uh, but we're going to get amped up a little bit because yep. this week, you know, we got a former uh, Boston Terrier legend, well, current legend and current college hockey analyst for ESPN joining us, uh, Kobe Cohen. Welcome to the show. What's a null? What is that? You guys have referenced that twice now. It's the League of Opportunity. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. NHL below the USHL. That is the null. Yep. It's the League of Opportunity. That's a good... <laughs> yeah, that's oh, really... the, oh, the NA? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yes, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I literally... All right, I didn't... I'm not with the fight. I'm not with the uh, with the slang. I guess I probably shouldn't curse, huh? Sorry. No, you're good. No, we, we, to, we let it rip. You. Yeah, I'm covering a Bridgeport. You know, what's your experience been like so far at the tourney? Yeah. A lot of goals. Yeah. <laughs> which, you know, True. for me, that's, it's much more fun when there's a lot of goals. Um, it's not really fun to do those, you know, do one, 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 two, one type, yeah. you know, you like seeing games where there's wide open offense. Um, and actually we had, we had a lot of offense in our region. So uh, I thought it was good. Um, not surprised that UMass came out of our region. I actually, it's kind of who, who I thought would come out of the region. I don't really, I'm not really, uh, I don't really make public picks. I don't really feel like uh, dealing with that, but um, yeah, I, I, UMass is a good team guys. Like, I, I don't know. I, I think any, anybody's going to have a hard time beating UMass right now. I mean, obviously all the teams left are pretty good, mm -hmm. um, but I'm super impressed with the, uh, you know, with, with what they've done there and they had to cut some dead weight. And uh, I think, you know, the guy with no teeth on the podcast is one of those guys <laughs> they had to get rid of, but um, yeah, that's a shame. they, uh, they seem to have their shit together. And, and I said it on TV and, and it's funny cause I kind of walked it back because Barry gave me, gave me a hard time about it, but, and you can't fight with Barry, like Barry's a legend. Um, but I actually think, the camp, the the U, the UMass team is actually a better all around team than the one that lost in the championship a couple of years ago. I mean, I I think that um, they obviously don't have <laughs> Kale McCarr, who is you know insane. I mean, the, the kid's a freak. Yes, right. he's, he's so good at hockey, like it's scary. <laughs> but they've got you know they've got three. They've got like they've got six good defensemen. They've mm -hmm. got a couple of really good defensemen. They've got three very good centers, you know, on any given night, you can't even name who their best player is because it's such a well-rounded team. It's, <laughs> it, it was a good region. You yeah. know what I mean? It's, it's a, it was not, it was not the North Dakota region, obviously with, with all that madness. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I was, you know, I thought it was a good level of play and, and um, you know, I wasn't all that surprised that BU lost, you know, they're not very good. And oh, BC, I'll be honest, I had higher hopes for BC. Yeah. I thought yeah. they'd win that game. Um, I was a little bit surprised because I just didn't think they showed up. Mm -hmm. You know, like their yeah. good players really just didn't show up. Like you, you can't not show up in a, in a playoff game like that. Mm -hmm. So, but in all, you know, so it's been a pretty good year. Thank God we're playing, right? Yeah, and right. We'll take last it. year we got canceled. Exactly. So yeah. thank God we're playing. How about uh, the Big Ten going 0 2 versus WCHA in the tournament? I mean, yeah, I mean, and COVID, they went on too, obviously, but like, yeah, I think the B is shocking Wisconsin and then Gophers isn't Mankato was a, a shocker. Yeah. You know what? Wisconsin didn't play well. Like they were a better team than what they showed. Yeah. Their defense was just had a really bad night, like bad. I yeah. mean, every goal was just like 
a bad turnover. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they didn't get great goaltending either. You know, like there's probably a couple he would have liked back, but you know, those WCHA teams, they're big, they're older, they're stronger, they're heavier, you know, they're structured. They know when they're playing against these big name schools, like they give 400% effort. So good for those guys for, yeah. for, uh, taking it to Wisconsin and, you know, Minnesota state, like good for them. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll see what happens, but yeah, the big 10, they, I mean, look, I, Michigan, they could have run the table. Mm-hmm. They could have gone, they could have lost five, one, or they could have won it all. You yeah, know, right. just don't really yeah. know with, with that, with that young group, but those kids are skilled. Yeah. There's some good hockey players on yeah. that team. So. Yep, I nope. had them coming out of that region, and yeah, they'll yeah. be back next year, even yeah. more hungry. But uh, one thing I wanted to ask I mean, you about Kobe, unless they <laughs> they might lose half their team, though. I mean, they could lose uh, what six guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like their whole freshman class could be gone. <laughs> That's <laughs> so true. true. But yeah, I just want to ask you about like uh, you tweeted before the tournament, and we threw it on our Instagram page about you know coming into playoffs. You saw North Dakota. I think everybody did as a clear number one, kind of the team to beat. Like, were you shocked at that? I mean, it took five overtimes. It kind of like makes sense. Like, yeah, that's what it's going to take. Or were you like, wow, I still didn't think they go out. You know what? Uh, Look, it's a one game elimination. Um, North Dakota, to me, they look like the best team going into the tournament. Like, I I, I stand by that. I mean, I watched them play that NCAC tournament and I was like, these guys could give the Sabres a run for their money right now. So, um, They're nasty. you know, I'm just kidding, obviously, but, yeah. but yeah, no, like they, they looked really good. I, I was surprised, but again, Duluth in the playoffs, I mean, you know, you probably don't want to bet against them. I'm not saying you got to bet on them, but yeah. I don't think you want to bet against them. No, no, that's fair. That's yeah. tough to do. Won me a little bit of money on that one. So that, was, that was good to see it come back around. They were, they were the dogs, I'm sure, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it was 250. It was not. It was juicy. It was, <laughs> it was, wow. it, was a, it was a decent day. But yeah. And what do you think about what do you, what what's the line? Do you, have they set the lines for the Frozen Four games? They not? had to, but I haven't. We have another guy who's not on the pod with us tonight that gives us all the insider information there, like what he thinks. And yeah, the yeah. line. So I don't know. I, I'm assuming that Duluth's favored. <laughs> I would think I would take UMass, but, UMass but like it's got to be thing. so it's got to be just basically a pick. Yeah, it's probably pretty. I mean, it's probably even money. And I, I yeah, jeez, yeah, I mean, that's a that's a tough game. To <laughs> that's a t- I'm not touching that game. Yeah, I don't the whole Frozen Four. I mean, I got beat up on Saturday so, or was it Sunday. <laughs> the Gophers. Yeah, whatever. Was that Sunday? <laughs> I mean, that was look that shocked me. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I Minnesota to me could have like if you would have said pick three teams that I thought might win it all. Mm-hmm. They would have probably been one of the three teams oh, that yeah. I picked. I mean, yeah, they man. looked that good in the Big Ten tournament. I mean, mm-hmm. they looked dominant yeah. in that tournament. So, um, you know, I, I was surprised. But again, like they just didn't they didn't show up. I yeah. mean, like no I didn't show. notice Reedy or Ranta or Walker. Like I just I didn't notice any of them. And yeah. you just you can't you're not gonna win that way. No, yep. Yeah, it was especially after they took it to Omaha, who was you know a solid NCHC team, like seven to two. Yeah, so, saw yeah. more of it, or thought more would come of it. So I put a lot on. They ran into a neutral zone trap and bigger bodies, older men, and that was it. Yeah, I mean they wanted it more. Kato wanted it more. I think that was yeah. it. Just brutal. But what about? Uh, I mean, going in Frozen Four, you're going to be calling it there. What What are you thinking coming in? Like the matchups, the storylines. What are you looking forward to? Well, obviously three Minnesota teams. So yes, sir. Um, I think a lot of people in Minnesota will be watching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about anywhere else, but <laughs> ah, <laughs> Minnesota tough. will. Um, you know what? It's, it's, it's not necessarily the best team in college that wins. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's who's hot. It's sometimes who, who can string together a, a, a streak or, or whose goaltender is playing really well. Um, when you're in these formats, it's easy to fall in love with a team that you see play. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's easy for me to fall in love with UMass. I watched them play a couple games. I watched them practice. I met with them. I met with their coaches. It's just easy to like get a little mesmerized by that. Um, I mean, look, they looked really good to me. They look really complete. I'm not, I, I put it to you this way. If I was going to bet, I wouldn't put money on that game because <laughs> I just think that you're, you're flipping a coin. You're talking about two teams that look really good. Duluth is obviously a good hockey club. Um, you know, the, the, the brothers obviously have developed into pretty good players. You know, I, I did two years ago. I, I, um, I did a Duluth, I did a couple Duluth games, I guess in the frozen four. Right. Mm -hmm. So, 
Uh, they kind of looked like they were going to be good players, but they were freshmen. They were young. They were kind of skinny. Um, you know, like they hadn't really grown into themselves yet. They were playing kind of in the bottom bottom six. And obviously Swaney's been there for a while. Um, they've got a couple of new kids that I really haven't had a chance to see yet. Um, so I'll, I'll do that. Obviously this week I'll probably watch a couple of their games, their old games, and mm-hmm. see what, you know, uh, the Olsen kids like and and some of the new defensemen that I, I haven't uh, had a chance to see. And, um, you know, the goaltender is, is obviously a good goaltender. I mean, they seem like they just keep bringing in these four-year, these good four-year goaltenders every couple of years. So, um, you know, the other matchup, I, I don't know a lot about it yet. Yeah. Um, obviously, I, I saw these teams play uh, in the tournament, but it's a little different when you're watching and you're working than it is when you're really like studying the film. So this week, right. I'll, you know, I'll watch a couple of uh, St. Cloud games. Um, I'll watch uh, a couple of Minnesota state games. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll get to know those teams a little bit more. I mean, I know Mike Hayes things just from, you know, back in the day. So I know his personality a little bit. And, and so I, I'm sure that translates to his team. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a big, big, big day for Minnesota. That's for sure. For the <laughs> yeah. state of Minnesota. I think the only thing in that game is going to be St. Cloud's top four at Eastern Brodzinski's done. I mean, his season's over, yeah, so that's that, going to hurt. Is he, is he, did they say what happened with him? Uh, broken femur. Broken femur. Yeah, he got surgery the day of the game in uh, Albany there. So he's, yeah, he's done. And he's been hot too. Yeah, like he's a threat. Wow. So that kills he him. He broke his femur. Yeah. Yeah, that's pucks deep. <laughs> Yeah, the worst injury you can get. Yeah, that sucks, man. It's just the hit too. You saw the hit. You saw his leg. You didn't know exactly what it was, but it wasn't good because that's a tough kid and he was not moving. So yeah, pretty much the so leader on that will, team. Who who will uh, who will draw in for them? Like, or will they will they mess with their other lines, or will they just put someone on his line? I mean, what will I they do? I mean, I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> a good question. I don't know what they're gonna do. But I t- I'll yeah. tell you what, they were down one zip before that injury, and they came back and scored three on BC. So they did something. Oh, listen, there. they they. 40 they outplayed bc 40 minutes in that game oh, bc yeah. had a very good first period and i they thought did. geez st cloud could be in trouble here but yep <laughs> they beat the shit out of bu and bc yeah yeah i mean yeah it was credit to them they did it and good coaching by brent larson there but i don't know yeah, what they're, they're gonna solid. do for lions man but the whole state of minnesota is gonna be watching that game <laughs> i'll tell you that so yeah I don't, another team i don't want to bet against after uh betting against them would be <laughs> so i'm just gonna sit that one out probably too but uh johnny you've been quiet i feel sad looking at you give me a question bud yeah. well, I am sad over here. johnny's <laughs> feelings are hurt because yeah, he texted me the other night and i was on my computer and i who was this dim because i only have you know i have his phone number uh, i don't have it on my computer i only have it on my phone so he's all <laughs> his feelings are still hurt about that Hey, I, I was a little sad. I, I kind of, I, I did feel offended. I mean, we've had multiple conversations, but whatever. Not a big deal. Put it, <laughs> put it past us. But Colby, you were, you were a stud in the blue line when you played in college, and I know you touched on the UMass defenseman. Like I know Del Gaizo and Zach Jones are two guys to watch. But as far as your own curiosity, who are two other defensemen or one other defenseman that you're looking forward to watching most in the Frozen Four? Well, Kessel's a good defenseman too. I mean, he's he's right there. Um, plays different than Del Gaizo and, and, and Jones, um, but just pretty much as effective. Um, you know, he's a little more heavy. He's a bigger guy. He's got a little bit of a heavier shot, but he, he gets involved. Um, he's very aggressive. Um, you know, but I, honestly, the freshman Bollinger was really impressive to me. I mean, I really liked his game. He plays with Farmer, I think, on the third pair. Um, but Seriously, I liked all six of their D. I liked Felix was good. He, he's the kid who plays with Del Gaijo. Um, and at their whole D core to me was was good. It It's not what the loose D core was two years ago where you had like, you know, four NHLers, but you have, this is a really good deep six D. They can play in any moment. They do a lot of different things. Um, you know, I, I, I like their whole D core for sure. And, I mean, also, I don't know if you saw any of the game, and I know you're, you know, you're a former UMass guy, but how about Del Gaijo's brother, who's, you know, he's a role player. He doesn't play, you know, he doesn't, you know, he's not a, he's not a star player, but he was good. I mean, his line was in the offensive zone all weekend, and and they kept putting him out. Carvey kept putting him out and putting him out, and you know, he gets his first goal of the year on an empty netter, which he deserved. That's that's hockey karma right there. <laughs> but, um. 
you know, it, it's they're 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 a good team and they're they're deep on the blue line, guys. Yeah, I'm scared. That's a beast. But uh, I also want to ask you, as far as the five minute majors go, I know <laughs> in the 2019 Frozen Four, like UMass Denver, there was two five minute majors in the first like 10 minutes of the game. Do you think we're gonna see one? Oh man, I hope not. Like I, when they start doing these, re- like I, I get why they do the re- the replays. Like being a ref, just it's not an easy gig. I mean, I, I, it just, I, I actually, you couldn't pay me any amount of money to be a referee. It just, <laughs> it just doesn't seem. Yeah, no shot. It just, it's not for me. Yeah. And and I had a lot of buddies who worked the lines and ref in the NCA and the, you know, the American League. I mean, guys that I knew from playing and. It's a hard job, and, and I, I understand why they do the replays, but I, I really believe that, that both the NHL, the AHL, they, they need to ditch one of those guys off the ice, and they need a second referee upstairs. So one ref on the ice, two linesmen, get, get a ref off the ice because it's just going to create more space on the ice. Yeah. You're going to see more goals with more space, and put him up top and let him be the one to make those calls. Let him... The minute something like that happens, he's looking at the film. So that way, by the time the celebration and everything is done, he's going over the refs going over to the scores table, and the guy upstairs has already made a decision oh, or I like or that. has it. So I, mean, I hope faster. we don't get into that situation. I think that throws off the flow of the game, especially when like you know you're a power play guy and then you got to sit on the bench for eight minutes or ten minutes. I mean, it just totally screws up the rotations, and so. Our region was pretty good. We didn't have a lot of reviews. Um, I actually think the refing has been has been solid. I think the guys in my region did a nice job. I thought the goal, the replay where Walker scored for St. Cloud, like I thought they made the right call. I think that should have been a goal. Yep. I don't understand how it's a goal and an interference. Like I, to <laughs> me, that makes no sense. It's one or the yeah, other. Right. But it's like when you trip a guy and you call tripping an embellishment, it's one or the other. Yeah, like, right. come on. <laughs> um, but, but I, I think they've been doing a good job and, and Johnny, I, I gotta tell you, I hope not. Cause it, it really just, it kills the flow. It kills the audience. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not good for the game to have those long reviews, but I, I get it. Like they want to get it right. So I, I, you know, we all know, well, at least you know, Johnny. I don't know if you guys are hockey. You know, I don't know if you hockey, you guys yeah. played hockey or, or yeah, whatever. But like, oh, yeah. it Damn, happens Josh. fast out there, right? <laughs> so it's not an easy thing to call in in real time. No, you yeah, know it's what not. I mean? So it's such a quick game. But I like it. That was a good take, though. Just one more guy off the ice, have it ready to go. Like no wait. Um, right. I saw plenty of pucks be stopped by refs this weekend. Just get them getting hit and stuff. So I don't know. That's a good take, though. Well, it just takes forever to set up. But like speaking on just you know things that can improve the game and improve the experience for fans. We always kind of advocate every single week, I think, for fighting. Uh, <laughs> what's your take on, you know, getting some more scrums in college hockey? Can we mix it up a little bit there? I mean, look, I think fighting makes the game safer. Yep, exactly. I think half shields would, would, would make college hockey a, a better product. Guys had to wear visors. Yep. Um, you're just, you play a lot more cognizant of your hands, your elbows, and your stick when your face is exposed. Um I know Jack Parker is a big proponent of that. He's he he's been fighting to get college in, in visors for years now, years and years and years. It's an insurance thing, mm-hmm. um, so they won't. But yeah, I, I think you know fighting half shields, all that kind of stuff. It actually makes the game safer because um, you guys police themselves. You yeah. know what I mean? You're thinking you're going to exactly. think twice now. I do understand why an 18 year old kid versus like a 25 year old kid could be a little dangerous. Cause you're talking about a man versus a kid who might've just gone through puberty. Um, like literally. So <laughs> yeah. I, I get why it, there could be some, some dicey moments there, but you know, I'm, I think fighting is not a big part of the game anymore, but I do think having it as an option is, is, is reasonable. You know, I mean, I used to have, two, three fights a year as a pro. I mean, when I, when I played in the, at the NTDP or, or, um, you know, even in the USHL, I, I had some fights. I, 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 you know, so I I think it's, it's, it's reasonable. I, I don't, I don't disagree with where you guys are heading with that because I, I do think a little bit of college hockey, especially with some of the, 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 the bigger conferences. And I don't mean bigger, like, I don't mean, I mean more like, uh, like the bigger, stronger kids and yeah. some of the older guys in the conferences, I think the game gets a little chaotic and a little physical. And I think 
it takes away a little bit of the skill of the young, flashy kids in Big Ten or from hockey. So I think, you know, maybe if you you put the visors on guys or you add fighting or whatever, then I think maybe you, 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 you see a little more skill actually come out and the game becomes a little more fluid, a little less chaotic. So I, I agree with where you guys are kind of going with that. Love it. Yeah, so we got another signature to add to the, <laughs> the petition there. That's huge. <laughs> I mean, we're seeing it like every week. My, I don't think my signature counts for much these days, guys. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I disagree. Disagree. Agree disagree. <laughs> we'll take it. But yeah, I mean, we what's up? We get your autograph. I can't. I, can't I still can't I, hear I, what you're I, saying, I've been John. disowned by my own program, so I don't. I don't know how much juice I have anymore. Oh, that's tough. I mean. Well, we should touch on that. So what you BU? mentioned, yeah, yeah right. for BU, I mean, you, you mentioned how they weren't very good this year. Could they use you back in the sweater there? Because, I mean, you were a legend at one point with the, I mean, just take us through your time as a, you know, as a Terrier for maybe your last two years there uh, compared to now. Because I didn't even know that, you know, this whole disowning thing's going on. But we can touch <laughs> yeah, on that no, later. I mean, I don't think I'm, I think I'm just exaggerating a little bit, but I, okay. I did have a, you know, I have a lot of, I, I think I have a lot of unhappy people there on Com Ave because I, I've been a little bit outspoken. Um, okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I've been a little outspoken and I've been a little disappointed. I, I think about my experience. I played for three incredible coaches, Jack Parker, Mike Davis, and David Quinn. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, they're all very unique guys. They're all very different. I learned more about hockey in those three years than I did in my entire life. I went there as a, a kid and I came out a bit of a grown up because of those guys. Um, you know, they got the best out of me. They taught me how to skate backwards. They taught me how to play defense. None of those things I knew how to do when I got there. Um, I'm not even kidding. Like Quinny taught me how to skate backwards. Like I couldn't skate backwards when I got there, which is a problem for a defenseman. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, like it, it's my experience was so good. I mean, that, that program is, it means so much to me, the trainers, the equipment guys, like I, I, I just, I cherish that time. Obviously we won a championship, which yep. is which is such a great experience to be a part of. Like it's such a bonding experience. We just had our 10 year reunion, which was such a fun time. I still talk to a lot of those guys. Um, and yeah, I'm disappointed in the program. I think they've lost their identity. I think when they lost David Quinn, it was a bit of a shocker. Um, obviously, like the Rangers just kept offering him more and more money. I get why he went. <laughs> I do. He's a competitor. Yeah. The Rangers offer you 10 million bucks. You, you know, after you tell them no three times, and then they up they double their offer. Well, then you got to go. So, <laughs> I yes, I've just been a little disappointed, and and I hear all these. You know, I just I hear a lot of things that I, I feel a little embarrassed about because I do wear the the, the, the brand with pride. Um, I'm very proud to be a, a terrier. And so when I hear, you know, things about what's going on there, it's it's disappointing to me because I, I expect more. And I feel some, you know, I, I talk to some of the players who go there and can't can't get out of there quick enough. And their experience is just so different than mine. And. It's like, you know, I want them to have my experience. I want them to know what it's like to really love being a terrier and be a terrier for a couple of years. So, um, you know, I, I piss a lot of people off with a lot of the things that I say, but I, you know, that's just who I am. You're honest. I'm not here to, I'm not, I'm yeah. not here. I, my job is my job. I take it very seriously. And if you don't agree with me, that's fair. Um, I, I never, uh, I, I'm not even saying I'm right. It's just my opinion. You yeah. know what I mean? And so people don't like my opinion and they voiced it back to me. One guy in particular, who's another alumni. Um, and you know, the one thing I will say and, and to go on the record when, when coach Parker's name was getting dragged through the mud a couple of years ago, um, and they were, you know, basically trying to, uh, get rid of him, mm -hmm. and, you know, coming from high levels at the university and, you know, they were almost like smearing his name and, and they, they, I was the only player who spoke up the only one. I mean, I had already left and, and I went right on the record with the paper, um, in Boston and you can look the article up and I, obviously the allegations were terrible and, and the things that were being said about the program were, were really bad and really serious, but I wanted to go on the record to make sure everybody knew that that was not something Jack Parker did not lose control of that program. Jack had a pulse on it. 
Um, you know, he was an incredible coach. He was an incredible guy. I still keep in touch with him and his family. He treats you like you're his family. Um, if I needed to get bailed out of jail at four o'clock in the morning, if I called coach Parker, he would bail me out of jail. Like that's the kind of guy that he is. Mm -hmm. So no one had, no one had the courage to speak up and defend him then. And I did. And, and now I have the, you know, no one has the courage to speak up and say what they really feel. And, and a lot of guys talk about it and, and I just, you know, I'm the one who speaks out and speaks my mind. So if I piss people off, you know, like they want to take my, uh, take my carrier card away from me or, or, you know, erase my name off the walls and again, it's Arita, you know, I, I can't really control that, but, um, you know, I, I, I hope they can, you know, find good leadership there and, and get the program back on track because, you look at these college programs, it's all about, it's all about leadership. It's all about the guy at the helm. It really is. It's, you know, you look at these successful programs, they all have one thing in common. They have an incredible leader. You guys are, are spoiled. You've got Scott Sandlin who who knows how to lead a program and Mm -hmm. UMass has Greg Carvel and, you know, BC has Jerry York, Nate Lehman. I mean, I, I can name a lot of really talented leaders um and um you know i i just i i hope uh bu gets back to that right yeah i mean that's just crazy hearing all that i don't think anybody at least here in this room should be uh or whatever say somebody should be taking your terrier card because i mean you're speaking with a lot of passion like you had the success that you you know saw when you're playing there so yeah just i man, i loved it. my time at school and yes we won but the year before we won i loved it mm-hmm. the year after we won i loved it I loved everything about it. I loved my teammates, the facilities. I loved going out after a win on Saturday night. They were the most fun nights of my life, at, yeah. you know, with the guys. I loved That's the bean pot. Like, I literally looked forward to the bean pot. The day the bean pot ended, then I'd start looking forward to next February because <laughs> I loved it. I played at Fenway Park. I freaking loved Like, I, I had such an incredible experience of uh-huh. hockey there that – um, you know, I, I want other players to have, I mean, I, I'm one phone call away from Mike Arruzzioni, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, like that's special, you know, and yeah. it, it, Jack O'Callaghan, you know, like I, I follow him, he follows me back on Twitter. Like it's incredible. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you laugh and stuff, but it's, 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 it's a good it's, feeling, you know, um, it's incredible. You know, like if I, if I needed uh, if you if you're in the alumni network and you need to get in touch with 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 Mike Ruzioni, he will talk to you and he will be there for you. Like that's how the, some of that group of people is. And I just I I I kind of feel sorry for some of the kids now who go there and they just they can't wait to leave. It's mm. it's, it's it's it sucks. It's not right. It's sad to hear. I think, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like we want to hear more people with your story. Talk about why college hockey is so great. Why their experience is so great. But yeah. uh, well, in college hockey is just better when BU's on top and, you know, kind of having all that. It is a rich program, but I think like you, like you said, it's going down and it shouldn't be because it's yeah. such a rich history. David, D- David Quinn did a really nice job of kind of there was a there was a little <laughs> bit of a lapse between, you know, when Quinny left and Jack was still there. And, um, uh, you know, look, recruiting is a big part. And and it took Quinny like a year to kind of get his some of his guys in. And Steve Greeley did an incredible job, too. I mean, Steve Greeley is one of the brightest minds in hockey. Uh, he was an assistant GM in the NHL for multiple teams. He was a coach at BU. He's like probably one of the best recruiters they've ever had at BU, maybe besides Quinny. <laughs> but, um, you know, they were starting to trend back in the right, you know, mm-hmm. back to where they belong. And then when Quinny left, it was kind of a quick, quick spiral down, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I yeah. was going to say though, boys, it's good to know that ECH now is one call away from Mike Ruzioni or two calls away. Two calls it's, away. It's two. <laughs> yeah, call Colby and Colby will call. I, I'm not, I won't be sharing that info with you guys. Sorry, <laughs> I just do want to go into the 2009 game though. That, that game versus Miami is insane. Uh, my beavers were in that frozen four, but you guys obviously won that. Just run us through it. You're down three, one with a minute left in that game. Just run us through what happened, what that feeling was like for you winning that game for BU. So you're a Bemidji guy. Yeah. I went to Bemidji state. Yep. And I worked <laughs> for the team there for three years. So I know Tom territory and those guys, but, uh, yeah, he's a good guy. He really is. Mm-hmm. Like it's easy to root for those guys because he's such a good dude. Yeah. Um, and you know, Matt Reed's a great guy too. Yep. I became buddies with him. And I knew him in the USHL and then I, I became friends with him in pro just cause he was in Philly. And I, you know, in the summer we, we spent a little time together. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I've only met him once. I just graduated in 2019, but he came to visit the guys uh, two years ago, three years ago. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, we were pumped that we didn't have to play them, by the way, in the first <laughs> round of the NCAA tournament. Like I've told this story a couple of times now. Yeah. Because, you know, you just you don't want to you don't want that team. They're they're big, they're defensive, they're structured, they they're get into the NCAA tournament and like they play like their lives depend on it. Mm-hmm. And we were pumped that we got Ohio State <laughs> in the tournament that year and not Bemidji. And yeah. then Bemidji beats Notre Dame, who's the second best team in the in the in the country that year, mm-hmm. beats them and then makes their run to the frozen four. So and um, we were pumped we didn't have to play them in the finals. I mean, literally, we, yeah. we did not want to play those guys. Um, Jeez. <laughs> 09 was obviously pretty special. You know, we we had a really good team. Um, the way we won, obviously, was pretty dramatic. You know, Miami of Ohio was actually a better team than we thought. I don't think we I don't think we went into the game like giving them enough respect. Just mm-hmm. to be honest, I think our team was pretty arrogant because we were really good. I mean, we lost maybe three or four times that year. That was it. Right. Um, and we had a, you know, we had a lot of good players. We could, we had, we had three really good lines. We had a fourth line that was, you know, if you think to like, whenever the, whatever NHL team wins every year, they always have a really good fourth line, whether it was like, you know, the, the Thornton, Pye and, and Campbell in 2011, whether it was like Sunquist line on, you know, uh, St. Louis. And it's just, it's like a theme. And, and our fourth line was like that at BU, Joe Perez, Cohen and Luke Popko. I mean, those guys would, you know, they were good. So our, our team was really good. And, and, you know, we, we like to make it interesting. Vermont was a team we struggled with. They beat us, they beat us and tied us that year, like, or beat us twice, maybe like, which we didn't lose many games, like I said. So, uh, yeah. We weren't, you know, we had a tough time against them in the in the Frozen Four. I mean, we we very easily could have lost that game. Our, um, we didn't, and then obviously, you know, the Miami game was 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 insane. I mean, the, if you really watch though, and you think about some of the plays that were made in that game to win, um, the uh, the tying goal was just an unbelievable play. Benino scored it. Um, but you know, Higgins and Gilroy both made unbelievably good plays that most guys couldn't or wouldn't make. And then, you know, obviously we, we win the game in overtime and, and I was, you know, I got a good bounce on a shot. Um, you know, I had, I had had a couple of opportunities actually throughout the frozen four. I think I hit maybe three, three p- pipes Jeez. between in those two games. Um, <laughs> so I was like, I was, I was feeling it. Yeah. And like, right I, there. I say this and I, I say it like as a joke, but I also say it kind of dead serious. If he didn't, if Roder didn't block that shot, I, I was still going to score there. I was just going to score short side under the crossbar. So, um, like I, I had my spot in. picked and I, I'm pretty confident that that baby was going in, but you know, I'll take it the way he did it. It makes for a better story that way anyway. And the boys were able to give me a lot of shit about it because of <laughs> the way it went in. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, you know, that was awesome probably one of the only moments in my life where it was like an actual blackout after like i i don't remember after i scored that goal like the next like 30 seconds were just are a total blur like i i can relive certain moments in my sports career like i remember pretty vividly like walking out onto the ice for my first nhl game like i physically like can go there yeah i remember my first college goal i remember my first bu game i remember the first time we played michigan like first usa game. i just could that moment, I, I just can't go back to it because <laughs> it's just a total blur, obviously, yeah. Yeah. after after I scored, yeah. um, even most of the night <laughs> thereafter. <laughs> I, bet. I um, imagine. It's like yeah. the only time in my life my dad has ever drank. <laughs> so my, my dad my dad's not a drinker and okay. he drank that night. And my mom was there. My younger brother was there. I had a couple of my, my friends took the ride up um, to my like high school home friends or whatever. So that was cool. I mean, it was great experience and, and unreal team. Great guys though. Like we had a lot of, I mean, a lot of guys that are, I'm, like I said, I'm still pretty tight with and see at weddings all summer. And, and, um, you know, I, I, we, we certainly, it was very dramatic, you know, like I said, we didn't, we didn't give Miami enough respect, which was kind of stupid because they had, they had a lot of really skilled players. They were well coached. Um, they had a good game plan. They were fast. They were physical, um, you know, Carter Camper was a stud. Andy Mealy was a stud. 
you know, they had a they had good goaltending. I mean, they were they were a good team. So I actually, believe it or not, I I, I was rooting for them to win one when Rico was still coaching there because I, I really like their coach. Well, he's not their coach anymore, but but I really I I, I appreciated him and I I liked him. Are you good? Uh, yeah, it was it was you know I mean I'm sure you guys have seen the video. It was it was as good as you can imagine and. <laughs> You know, we had a lot of fun thereafter, a lot of fun nights out. Um, you know, the university was, was pretty, pretty great about giving us a little space to, to have some fun. And, and obviously we were back in school a couple of days later, but um, good times, you know, <laughs> great group. You know, winning in college is it's pretty cool. I mean, you know, I was an extra depth player for the Bruins Cup team. You know, I have a cup ring. I didn't do shit to deserve it except, you know, get bag skated every day and get put on the bike. You <laughs> know, something. I traveled with the team, the whole playoffs and, and, you know, it's just, uh, you know, you, you take warm ups here and there and then you're up in the press box and, you know, as a competitor, you want to be a part of the team, but it was still obviously really cool to see a, a group of guys go through the grind to win the Stanley cup for two and a half months. And, mm-hmm. Mark Recchi, Char, I mean, these guys are legends and, and, you know, Hall of Fame types of guys and players and Tim Thomas. I mean, um, <laughs> awesome guys. And so that was fun. Um, those guys had a blast. But there's just something about winning when you're in college. You know, you're not you're not going home to your family and your kids. You're, you know, you're with the boys. You're all going to the bar together or the house party, whatever it may be. And, and there's just this camaraderie that um, you just don't have probably at the NHL level. Um, right. so it, it, it's special. It, it really is. I mean, I, I, I don't know how it would have been. Um, um, you know, if you won a couple or if it's not as good, the second, I have no idea. Mm-hmm. I never, I didn't win the second one, uh, in college, but it, it was, it was, it was great to be a part of, man. That's, that's why you go to college. You go to college to win a championship and, you know, have fun and, I got to do both. I guess you go to school too, right? But you know, that's just on the side. <laughs> yeah, not everybody goes to play school, you know. <laughs> there you get, a little, get some pucks in deep too. But yeah, what do you think about college hockey? Uh, I mean, a couple of wrap-up questions here. Yeah. Going a little long. We don't want to keep you too long. But uh, like, how much, what do you think has changed the most from when you played till, till current day? Like, is it just less physical or what would you say? Uh, what I see is I see kids not staying at all. Yeah. You know, like... Yeah good players are leaving early. You know, it used to be the freaks would stay one year and leave. Mm-hmm. Right. But now the, the NHL is just getting younger and younger. And like guys who are third round picks leave after one year, mm-hmm. you know, it used to be top 10 picks would leave after one year, but Colin Wilson was the seventh overall pick played two years. James Van Riemsdyk was the second overall pick who played two years. You know what I mean? When yeah. do you see that happen anymore? You don't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I don't think teams have the opportunity to be as good because they're just not together. You know, you look at Duluth, they got a lot of four-year players. You look at some of these teams that get four-year players, but they don't necessarily have the same high-end skill, the first overall picks and the top, the first round picks. So I think a little bit of that is missing from the game of college because guys leave so early. I mean, if Michigan returns all their players, they they could just go 36 and 0 next year. Like I, (laughs) If you put that yeah. whole group together for a second year, yeah. how, how, how would they lose a game? I have no idea. <laughs> so, but it doesn't, it's not realistic. It's not going to happen. That kid power, you know, he's gone. <laughs> he's gone. I mean, they're all going to be gone. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I, 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 it's a little disappointing to see these mid round draft picks leaving school early. Like, I don't know why, because I can tell you right now, I probably played 300 games in the American league or something like that. And there's nothing glamorous about it. Mm-hmm. it there just isn't, you know what I mean? If you're yeah. going to go be in the American league, you should stay in school. <laughs> the, they're not going anywhere. So, um, I, I you yeah. know, I, I, I would say I would love to see the trend start shifting back, but unfortunately I don't think it's going to happen. Um, young players are cheap and you know, and, and so I think NHL teams like those rookie contracts. Mm-hmm. Um, for sure. But we'll see. I mean, I, I, I look at a team like UMass, I think Kessel, I think Jones, I think all those guys should come back. I, I think they'd be silly because I don't think any of them are ready to go play in the NHL right away. So, you know, come back for your junior year. And then, and then I think, okay, you, you did your three years now go. Mm-hmm. So, um, but, but look, I, I love, I love my, my role in the game of hockey is one that I'm very comfortable with, you know? 
Um, you know, I, I've sort of learned how to talk about it on the air and, and I get to work with great people. Um, I have more fun doing a game with Butchie and Barry just because we all have such a good time together. I mean, I, we laugh the whole game. We enjoy what we do. We go to dinners. It's like being on a team. You know what I mean? Yeah. We're there a whole week. We're having three meals a day together. We're sitting in meetings together. We're, you know, we're, we're chirping each other. We're, <laughs> we're chirping players. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's pretty cool. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a good thing to be a part of. Yeah. I mean, you guys can tell you have that chemistry on the air. That's why we were pumped. And I, I mean, obviously Butchie's calling the game. But I was like, holy shit. Yeah. The whole crew is going to be there and that's going to be awesome. So yeah, we have it. the three of us just, we, we get along great. I mean, it's, it's, it's not fake. It's basically just what we do at dinner carries over to the air. I mean, I, <laughs> it's I, huge. I chirp Barry, I chirp him all the time and you know, <laughs> he comes right. Cause we're so different. I mean, just think about it. You've got a guy who's from S- Saskatchewan who is a legend in the NHL with a 32 year old guy who has, you know, I couldn't point Saskatchewan out on a map. So, <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? Like we just, so, you know, like I, the other night we were sitting at dinner and I'm like, Barry pulls out an iPhone and I'm like, you have an iPhone. I'm like, why do my messages come through green on you? Like what's going on here? Like I was wildly offended. So I'm like, give me your phone. And he gives it to me and he's got iMessage flipped off. And I'm like, dude, your phone bill has to be insane. Cause you're, you're, you're getting hit every time you send a text message to yeah. the States. You know what I mean? Cause he, he, he goes back and forth. Yeah. And so I give, I, I put iMessage on for him and then he's giving me shit. He's like, these messages come way too fast. Like, <laughs> like we, and then, and Everybody then I talked him now. about it on the air and I did, I was like, you know, we're, you're a blue message guy. Now. You know? So like that, that kind of stuff, it's, it's real. Like we, we, we go, we go back and forth like that just when we're sitting at dinner. So, um, he's a legend. Like I, I, uh, I just, Man, if you could ever have dinner with Barry Melrose, like bid on that raffle because he's he's a beauty. <laughs> I know that's a popular word in hockey, and he he. Sh- if you were gonna say put a picture of what a beauty is and the the, de- the definition, it's him. He really is, man. He's he's that. incredible. He's an incredible guy. He knows. You watch film with him. He he can dissect a play when we're doing film before a game. Like, and I learn from the guy every day. Every time we watch something, he will point. I mean, the guy coached Wayne Gretzky. You know what I mean? Like Gretz, <laughs> yeah, shit. Gretz did the foreword in his book. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's 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 greatness. You know. Yeah. So um, we have that's a good legit. time. And Butchie is the biggest ambassador for college hockey. He's so passionate about it. Um, you know, we we again, a, he's a good dude. We 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 spend a lot of time together because we do a lot of games together, and and. Um, you know, he's a, he's a really good golfer and, and he's a good dude. And it's, it's very genuine. It's not always genuine with sports casting. Right. But yep. with, with these guys, it's super genuine. It's yeah. good stuff. Well, yeah. Again, Kobe, we do really appreciate your time today. And we're just looking forward to the frozen four here. Uh, we can't like offer you an ECH bump, which we give <laughs> players, but maybe on the, for the casting, we're giving you the ECH bump. Just uh, excited to watch you, Butchie, Barry, the fellas bring it together here. Yeah, man, we're so. excited. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I appreciate it, guys. And uh, we'll catch up again soon, all right? Absolutely. Right, yeah, reoccurring guests. Save <laughs> my number, Colby. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm going to delete it after this. <laughs> all right, so that's a wrap on Colby Cohen and Dave Starman. Again, thank you to those guys. Obviously, huge voices of college hockey. They're going to be on the call, both on ESPN and on the radio. So literally everywhere that you're watching that game, chances are you're going to be hearing from them. Mm-hmm. So just pretty honored that they, they joined us to preview that. Yeah, absolutely. It's huge for ECH, huge for college hockey, that they're the ones covering the game. They do a great job. Um, we Again, we're lucky to have them, and we're pumped to get this Frozen Four underway here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just cannot wait for that UMass-Duluth uh, revenge game, possibly for your boys at UMass. Obviously, my boys, too. We got Goddard. We got Murray. We <laughs> I got- mean, we're basically a part of the team. I wouldn't surprise be surprised to see us in the locker room wall in a couple of years. Yeah, I, mean, I think Carves kind of wanted us to you know, show up, kind of give everybody that leadership mentality. But uh, instead, we just trusted that to our boy Jake got at mm-hmm. he's got the C why not yeah I mean I turned him down this year but we probably will be a huge part of the recruiting process for most players going to UMass in the future I would assume so yeah um, that makes sense I, I want to be expected I mean I want to not expect you know to get another call next year yeah so again I'm sorry Carves you're watching this uh, I am rocking with of course he's watching we this. got uh, two J's fu- behind me right now four. I know They're but watching this. Come he's on. looking at that Scott Perunovich jersey behind me and he's having PTSD so I'm <sighs> sorry Carves I didn't mean it hey, I didn't UMass think jersey's about that. on the way 
Yeah, exactly. Signed we, by all the boys. We just need a J, and yeah. then, then we'll switch them up. But uh, yeah, huge Frozen Four. Uh, let's talk about the regionals real quick here, mm. James. Your your Beavs actually had a great showing. Touch on uh, how proud are you of those Beavs? Yeah, as a Beaver, and just, I know the whole town of Bemidji, um, to end Cole Caulfield's career, best player in college hockey, and I think the longest time like since 2000 started, I think he's the best going to be the best player to come out of college hockey as far as NHL career. The right. best. Better than Eichel. Better than Eichel. Better than McCarr. Better than nah. Better than Quinn Hughes. I think. Well, offensively, they played two or two different so, yeah, positions. For wings, for, for just a forward in general, better than better than Goudreau. Goudreau? Yep, I think Cobb really? is going to be the number one guy. Okay, I he mean, has he, that if, potential. If, if, now he's going to be playing with guys that it's just automatic for them, and so you give him any second to get a shot off, he's going to do the same thing he did in college. He's done it at every level. Yeah, it's yeah. I'm pumped. I'm pumped to watch him at the next level. Yeah, but, and he's uh, probably getting that Hobie Trophy coming in here. Back soon. back to the Beavs here though. Just an impressive, yeah, impressive touch game. On that. They had nothing. I mean, no one gave him a chance on on all the insiders except for ECH. Except for ECH, we yeah. all gave him a chance. We gave both we bump. both picked him. I think in our oh, tournament brackets. Yeah, we did. Um, big, big win and big win for the WCHA as well as Mankato. Now not winning one, but no two, and they're in the Frozen Four. So uh, I don't think Mankato. I think the WCHA, the Dub Cha going two and over the Big Ten was. Um, not a shocker on my end, but something that was definitely the average, a noted, yeah. The average viewer, especially if you're just a Big Ten fan, like maybe you, you love go for football or you know Michigan football, all that mm. kind of stuff, and then you're turning in and seeing a team like Mankato, yeah, you know, like Bemidji State taking it to a Big Ten school. I think it just came down to them being. Off guard. It came down to them being older, and uh, they're just happy, you know, to be in that spot to battle for that game, right? Like, you know, I think Wisconsin was looking a little past them, and. They got caught with a bad, you know, bad it's game. And it's not always the best team. It's who shows up. It's just a know? gritty team sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes Punk's it comes team. down to an ECH bump. But in that case, <laughs> both teams had it. And uh, Bemidji came out on top. So I'm proud of my Beavs and, and all that they did this year. Proud of the Beavs. I also want to speak on a team I'm proud of. Duluth. They only had to play one game, but technically it was like three. <laughs> I don't think they're coming out of that first one versus Michigan. But Oh, my goodness. We, my bracket was Starman? perfect in that game. Did you hear that I, heard him. I heard him. I heard him. Yeah. But yeah, he, he said Michigan's dogs. probably the most talented. Like Cohen said, too, who else we also had on this pod. But... I think Michigan's younger core. I hope they stay. I don't think they are, but I think they're Very the most talented I mean, we, team. So where players are bleeding right now, we get touch on that later. But yeah, mm-hmm. I was just again, I was happy they didn't have to play Michigan. They obviously mm-hmm. had fresh legs going into Nodak. They Which needed they that. Did, yeah. And then uh yeah, to pull up that upset was was huge for my dogs. Another frozen four on the under the belt here. It's like LeBron James. But they got I mean, the hardest of the matchups, I think, at the frozen four. So here they come. They do, I mean. but uh they also had the hardest of matchups in regionals. So it, that's all the dogs one game, do. Though. They they grind through. Yep, one game. They they don't ask you how. <laughs> they ask you how many. And we are on a, our way to three rings in a row here. Could so. be four if it weren't for COVID. Exactly. Uh, almost and five if they beat Denver. Imagine we still Scotty. Scotty said he wouldn't leave because he'd just keep going back to backs. Yeah. So thanks thanks COVID. That's real nice of you. But His yeah, we got dogs heavy, so. rocking right now. We got two tennies that we can just swap in and out. Yeah. Are you kidding me? We got just <laughs> a plethora of riches here for the dogs. Sandy's just got the boys grooming. He's ready to just run over his yeah, son if he needs to in the national championship. Yep. So I was very proud of the dogs there. I was very surprised at the Gophers, I would say. That was the one slip up uh, yeah. from my bracket for sure. I had Gophers going to the ship. Mm-hmm. So that hurt a little bit. Uh, but Mankato showing up, like we said, Dub Chow rolling in deep. Uh, also, Quinnipiac blowing that game against Mankato. That was Hate nuts. to see it. That was nuts. And um, I don't yeah. know. I just, that was. Uh. <sighs> that was a tough one. You blow, what was it, 3 1? It's 3 1 in the three, blew one. That game. They scored with, what, 10 seconds left? And Yeah, same with Nodak. I think uh, it was two minutes just to get that yeah. first one. To make After it that close. first one, I was like, Duluth, they're fucked. They yeah. are fucked. And Not Duluth. Duluth. No, yeah, Duluth in that oh, game. Oh, Duluth, yeah. I yeah, said, yeah. this game's tied. They're going over. You were Not saying fucked. that. I yeah, I was scared. to my, I mean, they are screwed now. Duluth it's won that game twice. In they, OT, did. Man. they did win that game Stupid twice. Stupid callback. It, uh, yeah, I don't know. I was, I was easily the best game of the tournament, obviously, but. Yeah, um, I mean, just to tilt, I'm going through it. So that night, quick story here. I was in an uh, escape room when that just game a started. Brutal story. Yeah, share it. Yeah, so it was my girlfriend's birthday. We go to an escape room. I mean, just beautiful Buddy's timing. Trapped at six thirty, and you can't. I mean, we didn't get out of the escape room. It's a trapped. full hour they give you, and I was, you know, I'm busting my balls there <laughs> trying to get out, trying to watch just the game. carving at the walls. Right? And these are we go to the second hardest escape room. There, there's like oh. thirty. I go to t- Black like Diamond, tier huh? eight. Yeah, it was Black oh, Ops. Oh, we we're Black Ops operatives, and uh, let's just say a nuclear missile touched down in Chicago because we couldn't stop it in time. But I mean, they give you an hour. So what did that do to you? You now you're yeah, missing now, one period. Now it's two periods. I mean, you're missing so the there, second intermission. So no interview. goals had happened, and then there's an after party. There's me driving to oh. from all this. So I, I I grinded people, and then at the end of the night, it, it's two to two. Like I get home, I'm getting text messages like, "You missed the whole game." Uh, I watched overtime. I watched you missed overtime. the whole game leading up to over. Yes. So I watched five periods technically. 
But yeah, so I missed the whole. I get text <laughs> messages from Sabs in. jinxing it, saying your dogs are gonna do it. Holy shit, Deli, it's two nothing. I'm I'm popping beers because it's the after party that I'm at at this point. I'm friggin' <laughs> celebrating, and I'm te- checking my phone. It's vibrating like crazy again. They go, I can't believe the dogs blew that. And I was like, Sabs, you piece of shit. That's all I'm thinking. I know it's two to two, and I don't know how, but I'm mad at Sabs for jinxing it. Then we go into overtime. I'm still beers are flowing at this hey, point. Oh, yeah. I'm hammered at my girlfriend's birthday party, mm. and then I see that goal go in. I'm like, it's over. Turn off my phone. Hell fucking yeah. Dogs won three to two. First overtime. Boom. Yeah. Easy money. I start getting texts. Oh my God. They reviewed that. Yeah. Yeah. And then I have Our to watch. Blowing it up. Yeah. So then I'm just shit faced. I'm like in bed watching the rest of the overtime. My girlfriend's passed out and I'm just like, nah, I got to watch the rest just of this. Just one hand still in the game. White Claws. And I just, I had like. Yeah, the, I remember getting that snap. The yeah, biggest yeah, celly, yeah. but I had to be dead quiet because mm-hmm. the whole house like would have shook. Yeah. If I it was. I mean, a big payoff, but man, what a tough tough night for, for your boy here but uh yeah dogs are going dancing yeah and you missed a good day yeah. there man that was a, a day yeah. of great games and upsets with st cloud beating bu <sighs> and, yeah. i missed a lot i mean that kepke goal alone yeah blocked shot leading to a breakaway snipe it was just just an absolute oh. nip i mean yeah. in and out of the net guy's within point three seconds then no shit no, we're another guy for the top program in the nation another guy they'll be signing as soon as they win that third ring so uh yeah we're pumped what so let's go frozen four predictions i yeah. say uh you know my pick i think Duluth's gonna beat umass in a close one i'm gonna say that i think st cloud state it, it sucks they're losing easton brodzinski he's kind yeah. of been, you know the blood of that team. absolute stud piece he's been scoring like every freaking game for him too yeah he and that celly too it, god that was a nice celly to it's, BC, bc just you know hey, hey hi how, are, how are you yeah yeah I'm still taking them. I'm, I still think they're the better team than Mankato. Another greasy one. That one's going to be like two to one. Mm-hmm. Not a high scoring game. But uh, yeah, I got St. Cloud State versus Dogs. Dogs roll. Third chip. I think uh, I got Mankato coming out of that because Brodzinski's out and Cato's never been okay. there before. And um, It'll be close. It'll you know, be they, close. They, they, they got snubbed last year. Like their, their team was probably one of the best in the country, not the best. They're smelling blood. Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, so I think Cato, I think Cato beats St. Cloud because they're missing their top guy. Okay. And uh, I think the goal, they got a better goalie at the end of the day. And that's what it's going to come down to. I agree with that. But uh, we'll be catching it. We will be frozen for a trip is canceled to Pittsburgh as is official right now. But we'll be going to the yeah. schools to party with the students and get footage of just a day in the life of what the student takes in at a championship Saturday. Yeah, we do or, it for the fans. Or semifinals uh, Thursday. But yeah, it's going to be nuts. But yeah, I got Mankato. And then I hate to say it, but I do got going UMass. UMass. I'm going UMass. So uh-huh. okay. I, I think it's an over- overtime game for both games, though. I think it's. Yeah, I these think. are these are greasy matchups. Like it, you look at coin flips, kind of like what Michigan and Duluth would have been, kind of like Nodak and UMass. I will say this: I still think it's an upset for that UMass would win, though. But I'm going UMass. You're going UMass. I just think it's an upset because of Duluth's history. Like, yeah, we haven't seen the lines, but I think Duluth's probably going to be favorite. It's going to be like plus your minus mm, 105. One not time. even that. I mean, yeah, it's something like that. Maybe like you think it'll just, be right there. It's almost even. Like you can't even win. It's not going to be that game. nice plus two fifty payout I had against Noda. No, no. Oh god, it was juicy. <laughs> I mean, just talking about it, just a T bone steak. Just... <laughs> so yeah, I was pretty pretty pumped about that. Was another big celly at the end of the night for the dogs there. But <laughs> you like that? <laughs> oh fuck! So I'm going to be betting dogs anyways. I'll be winning money. Yeah, you gotta bet I guess dogs. technically taking your money if we go through the same bookie. Yeah, I don't think we do. We don't. But uh, yeah, Wendy's going to be ta- you betting on the dogs. Smart. So there we go. So we got two that's to one. A, I heard that. What did we talk yeah. about with Kobe last night? You can't never bet against the dogs, but you shouldn't bet for them. Maybe in this case scenario with pain. Don't tell UMass. me what to do with with my with my heritage. All all the games that I've won on this Frozen Four train that we've been on for four <laughs> years straight. You realize that's like LeBron. Like you look up, he's in the finals. Yeah, but it's that's not. The dogs. I mean, they got they got one guy it's managing the, the whole thing, but it's been impressive. Like all the guys they bring in, they're just ready. They're part of the heritage. Like you said, they're ready to go and win a game. Exactly. The dogs are a T bone. They're juicy. <laughs> they got four lines deep. They got guys who like Luke Milamak comes off the bench in the fifth overtime. It hardly played all tournament. Boom, he gets in there five or, uh, you know, how, how are you? Mm-hmm. You got him. Beyond, he's flying whenever you need him to. Uh, you got two ECH's tendies. Bump. You can cycle in and out. A deep decor. And yep. then you got Sandy at the helm just force feeding the boys, mm-hmm. whatever, you yeah. know, whatever they need. So, uh, yeah, go dogs. Yeah, uh, we're definitely not going to need smelling salts for that game, but we're no, going to no, take no. them. We yeah. are going to take them. And um, so. those are going to be ordered. Should we just do smelling salts with the fans at every school? Just like just rip them before every interview. Like That's how we start the interview. I think that's probably a smart move. Yeah. yeah. Get the juices flowing, you know. People are gonna want it. It's it's we're, we're, make it happen. It's happening. It's happening. Right, Smelling salts have been ordered. Yeah. This. Yep. Well, Smelling salts are coming to ECH here, and probably way too many. We might hurt our brains by the end of the day, but I think it would actually be helping, though. Don't you think? You don't want to do too much of it. That's for sure a thing. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh, there's like a. You will oh. not have brain cells. It it's it's well, not one light. One way or it another, it hurts. It hurts a little bit when you sniff it. Well, one way or another, we're not gonna have brain cells that night, so it's kind of like pick your poison. 
Especially if the dogs win their third. Can you imagine that that crazy of a night? Mm. Like, that's going to be... <laughs> yeah, the so town will burn down. If you want probably. to join the watch party of ECH, it sounds like 310 is the bar to be. Yeah, we, will, what, be, uh, uh, we will be COVID safe Saturday as best night. as we can. But If uh, the dogs win... Or, uh, well, I'm saying that more for you. When the dogs win, 310 is in Duluth. You might see the ECH boys there. I mean, I get there early. We'll do autographs before and after, but uh, after. I don't think we're going to be you know in the right mindset after. So probably get there before. But we will be, be signing, and uh, yeah, no, 310 is the bar to be at Cato. We don't know if we're going to Cato or Cloud yet for next week, but we'll definitely announce that on the story. Yeah, I mean, either way is a losing bet because it's hard to get, make it out of either places. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all three schools we just mentioned, it's not going to go well for yeah. us, but uh, we're going to be there. No regardless. longer do I have, you know, the capacity to drink more than like three beers without feeling it the next morning. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're, I'm going to be hurting now. either way. And yeah, uh, yeah it's going to be... You know, just stick to our systems, battling in corners. Mm, IVs in the locker room between <laughs> between between campuses and we're between going. <laughs> oh, shit. So, yeah, we're going to need all the help we can get people. So make sure that you're following us. You're you know going to our stories. You're go liking all of our posts and sub. Just mash that sub button. On yeah, YouTube. guys, we're almost a thousand on YouTube. Once you do that, where you're going to mm. see us going to more schools and more. Just Putting out more, more content because yeah, then we can actually to. make money off it and spend more time on them. So yeah, exactly. Uh, if you're supporting us and rocking with us, we do appreciate that. But also just thank you for listening to this episode. Uh, this is number 63, Brad Marchand. Yeah, Brad Marchand. Ooh. Thank you to Colby a number and there, Dave people. one more time. Mm. Again, Frozen Four is here, baby. Let's let's fucking rock it. And uh, next week, huge pod coming out. Even bigger somehow. This is our biggest podcast coming out next week. Uh, we're not going to release the names yet. They're too big to release. But yeah, you're going to want to tune in because we're it is all about Frozen Four, and that is it with some guys that you know pretty well. So you know some big guests who have been in the spotlight who might even be in professional hockey right now. Possibly. Can we say that? Well, yeah. well I'm not going to. Yeah, they are. Okay, yeah. So uh, yeah, maybe maybe tune in next week. But again, thank you guys for listening. I will say this. We can we can release this. It is going to be one professional hockey player from each school represented at the Frozen Four. You're going to want to tune in. You can't Boom. miss it. It's the podcast of the year next week, as well as this one was pretty pretty great. And yeah, uh, yeah a lot of college hockey knowledge is passed this week and next week. We're so. going from the voices of college hockey to the faces that you know and love. Yep. College hey, hockey there you go. And that is so a bad. wrap for you. Episode 63. Make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube one more time. Hit that alert button. You're going to just hit the bell. Just mash keep, it. Just mash that bell. Liberty Bell. Follow us. Everything bitch. college hockey on YouTube and uh, Team ECH as well on Twitter. Uh, TikTok, everything college hockey, and mm, LinkedIn, Instagram, everything college hockey. Thank you, fans, yeah. and we'll see you next week. It's a mouthful. Swipe, 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 swipe. Swipe, 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 swipe. Just picked up some bands, come and come again, come again. They do what I do, I'm like Simon says. Yeah, I'm the running man, rapping rubber bands, rubber bands. They do what I do, I'm like Simon says. They do what I do, I'm like Simon says. Swerving, making plays, Ferrari red. Never held my.